good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? We're going to start service in just a few minutes, but we'd love for you to just join us if you'd like as we worship. And these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet calls, lift your and out of Zion till salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are wide in the world. And we are your laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. At the trumpet calls, lift your voice. It's the gear of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. All right, let's try this together. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Sun at the trumpet calls, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet calls, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation. and I am the children's pastor here at Frontline. As most of you know, we had Frontline Kids Camp this past week, and so I just wanted to come up. Yes, woohoo! I just wanted to come up and just share a few things from my perspective of what unfolded this past week. We had 134 campers for our first ever Frontline Kids Camp. 
Yes, praise Jesus. On top of that, we had over, well over 100 volunteers. Most of those volunteers worked all day long. And then they came and they loved and served these children like they came from a well-rested place that they just didn't, had come just from work. It was, it was an amazing thing to see. There was kids worshiping Jesus in mighty ways. I even got a text message from a mom on Saturday saying that every time they get in the car, their kids are screaming for worship music. And just the whole car is just beaming of pure joy of him. And also, we also had 26 student volunteers this past week. And watching these students truly give away themselves and love these kids, that was like my most favorite thing. On Wednesday, one student was like, I was over in the back and they were running as fast as they could to me with this biggest smile on, their, on her face. And she said to me, Miss, Miss Pastor Amanda, there are two kids in my room that want to accept Jesus. It was so awesome, not only to hear those words, but to see that joy just radiating from her. And so I mean, her and I walked back to the classroom and we sat down with the kids and her and I started talking to those two campers about what the gospel story is, who Jesus is, who we are because of Jesus. And she was encouraging this child as we went. And then she offered the opportunity for this child to accept Jesus. And it was, it was a precious moment to see the Holy Spirit come alive in that child, but to watch this student shepherd this camper, that's what brought me to my knees. Amazing, it was amazing. Yes, yes. So this morning, we're actually gonna sing a song that we sang at camp. So if you have a camper at home, I'm sure you've heard this a million times already. But before we sing this song, go ahead and say hi and hello to the people around you. Surely in 
Church, can we just sing this hymn together, Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. on my heart to feel and grace my fears breathe how precious did that grace appear the hour I first know about you how many times uh, you've sung that song if you grew up in church uh, like I did um, you probably sang it a thousand times right 
Or maybe you heard somebody sing it, Celine, Celine Dion, uh, Elvis Presley, Whitney Houston. So many people have performed that song. I mean, it is a well-known song. And uh, I challenge you today, later, not right now, but Google that song, find out the story behind the song about why God's grace is amazing. And so I don't know when you came in this morning, maybe you came in this morning and maybe your summer has been awesome. Maybe your family vacation was great. Maybe the kids are actually listening to you this summer. Maybe uh, work is going well, maybe relationships are doing well. And uh, you're sitting here and going like, man, uh, how gracious God has been to me. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe it's the other end of the spectrum. Maybe things are not going very well. Uh, maybe the kids aren't listening to you. <laughs> maybe you're wishing school started tomorrow. Okay, but uh, maybe that family vacation wasn't great. And you're here this morning, you're going, man, I could use some amazing grace. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I encourage you from the words of God this morning? In Second Chronicles, it says, For the Lord your God is gracious and he's compassionate. He's not going to turn his face from you if, if you look to him. So maybe that's what summer can be, the rest of summer can be for you this morning. As we look back and we say, maybe it's turning to God and just seeing his grace every single day in the small things, not only in the big things, but in the small things. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a compassionate and gracious God. You are slow to anger and you are abounding abounding in love. And Lord, we pray as we worship you this morning that you find honor and you find glory in our worship. I pray, Lord, that it'll put a smile on your face. I pray that our hearts, Lord, as we come to offer them to you, Lord, that you'll receive this wonderful gift of worship that we give back to you. For you are a good God who gives amazing grace to each one of us. We pray this in your name and all God's people said, Amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Well, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Blake. I have the privilege of being the executive pastor of the Zero Collective. Zero Collective is just a network of churches who are just sold out uh, and to see zero people remain unchanged by Jesus. And Frontline is a big part of that. And so we get to do this together in community, not only with Frontline, but with three other churches. And so we live out that passion and that mission together. We also get to do things as church together. We have something coming up in community here. We have something coming up in August here. We have an outdoor baptism. So can I just see a show of hands? How many people who have been to an outdoor baptism at Frontline before? It's quite a few of you. How many people have been baptized at an outdoor baptism before? It's been a lot. Uh, you want to talk about going public for Jesus? That's what we call baptism here. That's like in a public park. We go actually really public for Jesus in a public park. And so maybe God has been moving in your life this summer. And it's time for you to go public. And so we would ask that, man, you would join us on, uh, on August 27 at 530. We're going to have dinner, and we're also going to have some time together of worship. But the important thing is we're actually going to uh, say to the Lord that, man, we're going to go public for Jesus with our faith. And so it just gives us an opportunity to do that together as a community. So I know we have some students. I met one just this morning who was walking and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to get baptized at the outdoor baptism service. And I was just so excited for her. So, uh, man, maybe that's you. So join us uh, August 27th for that. The other thing that we get to do together is we actually get to pray together. And, uh, man, prayer is bathed in everything that we do, whether it was kids camp, whether it's uh, we got a team going to Guatemala on Tuesday, whether it was the 40-plus students we sent to NTS, uh, it is bathed in prayer. And so maybe uh, you came this morning and you really need prayer. So, man, that's what we do here. And we have a banner in the back. So after the service, man, just work yourself, uh, work your way back there. We have people there that are designated to pray with you. And so we would love that opportunity. Uh, we get to do life in community together. Uh, as I said, we had Frontline uh, Kids Camp this past week. Amanda was up here just a little while ago talking about that. Man, that was an incredible, incredible week. And if you saw that video there, we had little kids worshiping. Obviously, those were the campers. Uh, but what was really cool is Amanda talked about students there also as part of the counselors. Not only did we have students there, we had young adults. Not only did we have young adults, but we also had some of the parents of the students in there. Not only did we have the parents, we had people from my generation who were serving in there. And so uh, as I watched that video, uh, there was a couple that uh, came to mind there. It was John and Chris Warren, who actually had been here for a long time. 
and to look at that video and not only see the smiles on those kids' faces, but to, to see the smile on John Warren's face, man, that's what church is about, family. With generations passing down faith to each other. So the fact that we get to do that, and we also just get, back, uh, get to do that by giving back to God, uh, kids camp, NTS camp, kids, uh, people going to Guatemala, that doesn't happen without people giving to this ministry. So if you are uh, a member of Frontline or if you consider Frontline your home, man, we're just thankful that you continue to invest financially into this church. So you'll see the out different options up behind me there. So thank you so much for how you continue to invest. So I'm going to pray for that, and then uh, David's going to jump up here and uh, teach this morning. So join me again in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, man, we've worshipped you so much already in song. We want to worship you right now, Lord, in giving back what is rightfully yours. We're just stewards of what you give us, Lord. Um, help us not to hold on to things too tightly. Lord, we come into this world with nothing, and we leave this world with nothing. And it's what we do in between that matters. And so, Lord, we pray that you would find us faithful. We pray, Lord, that you would find us obedient. We pray, Lord, that you would find us generous. And we pray, Lord, that uh, this offering would come back to you as a form of worship. I pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. Frontline, good morning. Just good to see all of you. Just so glad that you're here. If you're joining in person, glad that you're watching. If you're joining us online as well, I just want to say again to be the third person today, uh, just thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you that served uh, so significantly this last week. Uh, I will speak on behalf of all 100 plus volunteers. Uh, we are exhausted. Uh, brutally exhausted. I woke up this morning and the first word that came to my mind was nap. And uh, I heard, I talked to somebody else today that said, you know, you get to that point like in age when you start planning your naps. And so I'm planning mine this afternoon. I just want to say thank you to all of you that just gave from your hearts, you gave from your time. Even just like Amanda said, you worked full days at your job, gave it your all, and then you showed up here and you gave even more. So just thank you for the investment in our kids in the next generation, in the students. I mean, it, it was uh, a world of a difference that you will make in the kingdom because of that. So just want to say thank you as we jump in. Uh, opening question for you today uh, goes like this. Is the kingdom of God fair? Is the kingdom of God fair? When I grew up, I was sitting like, man, what's a fun story that I did growing up? I like to fish. I don't know if any of you like to fish. Uh, my boys are at the age right now, four and a half and one and a half, that it's kind of fun to start doing stuff like that with them, and then it's kind of awful. You, you remember that, that stage, if you're living that, maybe right now? Uh, the, the fun part is like the things that I like to do, I get to start bringing them with me. Uh, the not fun part is I don't get to do anything that I love. I just get to prevent them from killing themselves by doing the thing that I love. So that's kind of been my rotation lately. So fishing's fun for me. I want to get them fishing, but it brought me back to when I was younger. Uh, I am the oldest of four siblings. So it's me and then three other siblings. Uh, so I'm the oldest. We went fishing. We went to this little swimming hole. And you know how like sometimes it just isn't fair. Life's just not fair. We all went fishing different parts of this pond and all three of my younger siblings start reeling in fish and I get nothing. So right five minutes in, 10 minutes in, you're like, who cares? But they keep reeling them in. And every cast I do, I mean, my worm is just juicy. It's perfect. I mean, it's like right there, nothing, right? So now I start keeping score. I'm like, they've got four fish each and I have zero. So I start casting. You know how that, especially as the oldest sibling, you know how like you start casting where their bobber is? Like you see theirs hit and yours goes right after it. 
You, you know that? Or then you start getting desperate. Like, man, they're up to like eight fish now. This is a true story. I think they were catching 10, 11, 12 fish each, and I was at zero. I didn't even care at this point. They would release one in the water, and I would whip my, my hook down. I'll hook it by the tail if I have to, and I'll reel it in backwards. It's like I just started getting frustrated, right? So it's a, I love fishing, but there's something about going with other people that like I don't end in a happy place. Do you have anything like that in your life? Where, where all of a sudden it's like something that you love to do and you start doing it with people or with a group or, or with a different environment, whatever it is. You love doing it, but by the end of it, you go, I'm not fishing to fish anymore. Now I'm fishing to keep score, right? I, I'm not playing this activity anymore because I enjoy it. Now I'm playing it to win. You, you know what I'm talking about? The, this statement, my mom used to say this all the time, right? I would go to my mom, I would complain. My dad thought it was hilarious for the record. You know, here I am getting mad, reeling them in faster, co- casting with nothing. They're getting all of it. And I, I would go to my mom and I would say, mom, this is just dumb, right? And she would look at me and she would say the statement, David, sometimes life's just not. She talked to you too. You know the <laughs> statement. Drives me nuts. So here's the question I have for today. Is the kingdom of God fair? Like just sit with it for a second. Is the kingdom of God actually fair? A lot of times we go into something like we, we love it and we desire it, we're happy, excited, whatever it is, things that we love, things that we care about, things that move our hearts, our emotions. Well, a lot of times we dive into those, but then when things don't start going our way or when we start looking horizontally and we start comparing ourselves to other people, the idea of fairness just tends to creep in. And if we're not careful, it takes over. The idea of fairness like in marriage, maybe in families and siblings and friend groups in the workplace, whatever it is, when things start not going your way, we, we often become obsessed with the idea of fairness. Like I'm due or I'm owed or I'm entitled to at least equality in this environment. And if we're not careful, it also creeps into our relationship with God. In fact, it creeps in so much so that, that we may not actually see how much it's affecting us if we don't look at it through the biblical lens, which is what we're going to do. So here's what I want to tell you. The Bible talks about fairness. Uh, and in fact, Peter, one of my favorite disciples of Jesus, he's known for being a loud mouth. He often sticks his foot in, into his mouth so deep it's hard to remove it. Peter asked Jesus this question once. This is in Matthew 19. Jesus just got done telling the story to a rich young ruler. Like he, he's talking, he's having a conversation with a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler says, I've done all the commandments. What else am I supposed to do? And Jesus looks at him and he says, you have one thing. It's just one thing, sell all your stuff and then walk away. Then you can follow me. That, that's what's holding you back. And so Jesus says this to his disciples. He's walking his disciples through. He says, man, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And Peter, my favorite disciple, Peter speaks up and he says, hey, Jesus, what do we get for dropping everything and following you? You see the undercurrent there? We left everything, Jesus. We know this guy walked away sad, but what about us? We left everything. What reward will there be for us in heaven coming from this place of equality and fairness? And Jesus tells a story. So we're in this series right now. It's called Kingdom Culture. It's all about parables of Jesus. And Jesus tells these stories to illustrate what the kingdom of God is actually like. So here's how Jesus answers Peter's question. What, what's there for us, Jesus? Jesus says this, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. You tracking so far? There's a guy, he owns a big property, it's a vineyard, he needs workers, he would normally go to what's called the marketplace to find workers, so he goes out and he hires workers very early in the morning, probably around 6 a.m. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and he sent them into his vineyard. So a couple of details that you need to know because this story is going to build from here, okay? Owner uh, of the vineyard, he can hire whoever he wants, but it was not like a long term, he didn't offer a job, he offered a job for a day. So you would come in and there'd be a group of people who would work. They would come in and they would agree to a wage for a specific day. So the normal work day was 6A to 6P. It was a 12-hour shift. And you would show up and you'd be hopeful that you would actually get selected for work that day because you have a family and you have a mortgage and you have tuition to pay for and groceries to pay for and, and food for the camel or whatever it is that you need, right? You need money and you would show up and you'd be at the mercy of an owner, of a landowner to hire you for work that they had to be done for that day. So 6A to 6P, Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who owns a vineyard who hires a bunch of workers at 6 a.m. in the morning, the normal start, and a denarius is what they paid, was a normal wage for a Roman soldier. 
So far, everything's fair. Everything's right. Everything's normal. The story continues. Here's what Jesus says next. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. You hear the fairness undertone yet again? Now there's two groups of workers. There's the workers that were hired right at six and they're working for a denarius. But now there's another group three hours later that shows up and the owner says to these guys, I will be fair. I will pay you what is right. And they trust them. Notice they don't negotiate their salary. They just say, okay. So there's a group at 6 a.m. Now there's a group at 9 a.m. And it gets worse. For those of you that love fairness, you're going to be upset in this parable. Here's what happens next. He went out again about noon and about 3 in the afternoon and did the same thing. And about 5 in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. There are five groups of employees working in this field. The only one that has negotiated their pay or negotiated their salary or at least been made aware of their salary at the beginning is the very first group. So you're the guy or the girl or, or the family or whatever that's working out in the vineyard all day long and you keep seeing group after group after group after group show up in the vineyard. What's going through your mind? I mean, just be real, be human for a second. What's going through your mind? Here's what would be going through mine. I've been here longer than they have. I got more hours in than they do. I got more work in than they do. And remember, this is the Middle East. It is hot. So you've been sweating and working. You got calluses or blisters on your hands. I mean, you, you've been working all day long and you see group after group after group come in and they're fresh. I mean, they're good. They're ready to go. They're energetic. They're excited because think about this too. They did not get a job offer at 6 a.m. in the morning or nine, or noon, or three. Some of them, it, it, they didn't get one until 5 p.m. And your emotions start to take over when you're sitting there waiting, knowing you have expenses that don't change, but your ability to work is entirely contingent upon somebody else. They're at the mercy of a generous landowner. And so they stand, it's called the marketplace. It'd be right in the middle of the city center. That would be where you would go if you needed work. And the landowner is really significant. He keeps coming back all throughout the day. What do you think of this landowner? Here's what I think. I think he's generous. I think he's thoughtful. I think he's caring. I, I think the fact that he goes out and continues to hire people throughout the day just speaks to him, speaks to his character, speaks... It, it, and remember, this whole story is meant to illustrate something to you about the kingdom of God. I like this guy, but the guy does something unheard of in this culture. He hires people at 5 p.m. Do you remember what time work is over? Six. So at five, he hires them, then says, come on over to my vineyard. I don't know if it takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to actually get to the vineyard. And when they finally show up, they work just a little bit, but that's okay with that. They're excited to go home with something. Are you tracking with me so far? Let's read the next part of this parable. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard sent to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Don't read ahead. Just wait for a second. Jesus is doing something really specific, and he's about to stir the pot, as my mom used to call it. I was a pot stirrer. Anybody else? Uh, let me use a, a synonym, a tornado. Okay, when you show up, everything gets undone. Jesus is about to undo this entire story for all of his listeners because Jesus changes the order in which they are paid. Okay, follow me with this. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon, the ones that worked maybe an hour, maybe, more likely 45 minutes or a half hour. By the time they figured out what to do, I mean, maybe 10 minutes. I mean, let's be honest. We all work with people, right? Let's be honest, they didn't get a lot of work in. 
So the workers hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive, say it with me, more. Why? Because that's fair. See where it's going to enter in? More. Of course more. You're going you're to pay the guy that works 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half hour? You're going to pay him an entire day's wage? I can't wait to get my paycheck. It's going to be a good day. I mean, you can feel like the excitement. It's building like this is going to be an awesome day. My wife is going to be pumped or my husband's going to be pumped or my kids are going to be pumped. Like we are going home with a bank today. It's going to be awesome. But each of them also received a denarius. <sighs> All the air leaves the balloon. What do you start feeling if that's you? What, what do you start feeling? I mean, just get in touch with the emotions here of the characters of our story. What do you start feeling? That's unjust. That's unfair. Who are these guys? Or who are these girls? Or who, are you kidding me? Like, I did everything, and I got the same pay as them? How many of you like the landowner right now? Not a lot. Here's what's funny about this. I bet you do like the landowner if you like to sleep in, okay? You're going to throw a job application into this guy going, he pays the same no matter when I start. Put me in. I'll be there right around 430, and I'll be waving like, I'm here. I'm ready. Whatever you like to work probably depends on how you feel about this landowner. The, the longer that you've been at work or the longer that you've, you've done maybe what was expected or what was agreed upon, it channels a different type of emotions towards the landowner. So here's the last part. If we close out the the parable here. It says, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Those are fighting words, aren't they? I'm not being unfair. I'm not, I'm not being unfair. They're going, you, you just created all of us equal. You just made it unfair, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, actually, I didn't. I didn't make it unfair. He continues, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Ooh. Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. How do you feel if you're Peter right now? Hey, Jesus, what do we get for following you, for being the first in the field, for being the first ones to give everything, for being the first ones to sacrifice? Jesus, surely we get more than everyone else, don't we? Jesus tells this story, and then I, you can just picture him looking at Peter and just winking, going, what do you think, Peter? Let me ask the same question again. Is the kingdom of God fair? I mean, what's fair? It makes you define what, what's fair. What's fair in the story? Is fairness that they all received the same amount? Because if so, then this story and this parable that Jesus made is fair. Therefore, we should maybe arrive at the conclusion that the kingdom of God is fair. Is that fair? Do you feel like that is fair? Let me ask uh, it a different way. Is fairness, you get what you deserve? So the ones that were out there at 6 a.m., they should get more because they earned more, because they worked for it, because they were present, because they sacrificed differently. Did the ones at 6 a.m. get more than the ones at 9 a.m., and more than the ones at 12, and the more, more than 3 and 5? Is that fair? Is fairness determined by what you do and what you earn, or is it by everyone being equal? Jesus tells this parable to kind of unearth everything that was deeply ingrained inside of his disciples, and honestly, for us today. It forces us to reconcile and to actually define what is fair. What's unfair in your life right now? I mean, just think, like, what, what's unfair? Shannon and I, we're, we're in the stage of life uh, with our boys that, like, miserable is the word I would use for about 90% of it. Do you remember that stage where you're just like, you guys just fight for 
for fun. I mean, I used to do that. You guys just fight for fun. And Jordy, he, he's one and a half now. He's figured out, like, he's got arms. And he starts hitting Judah and pushing. I'm like, I have to discipline a one and a half year old. Like, he just turned into the Hulk for a second on Judah. And it, they're just fighting back and forth or they don't sleep well or whatever. And here's what Shannon and I do. We don't even mean to do it, but it's like we click into this mode. We start comparing who has sacrificed or who has suffered more than the other person. <laughs> do you remember this? Do you, do you know this? Have you experienced this? I come home after a long day at work. I'm exhausted. And Shannon goes, here you go. They're your kids. I'm going, I've been working today too, just very differently. And she goes, I've been with the boys all day. I put in my time. It's your turn. And I go, good grief. I'll take them. But then the weekend shows up, and I'd like to write some things. And she goes, nope, I'm not. I'm out. I need a break. We, here's what we do. We unintentionally keep score. What about at work for you? Do you look at somebody in a similar position as you? Do you look at maybe a supervisor or, or maybe like the leader or the president or whatever it is? Are you trying to weigh in your mind what is fair in your context right now? What seems unfair? What seems not right? Is somebody getting paid more than you for doing the same job? Maybe they do it worse than you. Does somebody have more vacation time or more seniority? Does, does somebody have more power and authority? Does somebody have something that you want that you don't have, but in your mind that you've earned it? What about in your neighborhood? I keep catching myself in this one. I drive down the neighborhood, and I just want to see what everybody else has. Is that bad? Like, I, I drive down the road, and I'm kind of like, what do they have in their backyard? <laughs> just curious. Oh, that looks fun. That looks cool. You know, some of them are putting in a, a really nice fire pit. I'm like, I have a fire pit, but they're, oh, I got some ideas, you know. Or somebody else has a pool. I'm going, a pool? You know, can't afford a pool, so I keep driving. I, I, it's like, I'm just trying to gauge, like, where do I fall? Is this fair? Is it unfair? I don't want to be on the side of unfair, and yet it forces me to reconcile with this fact. Is, is the kingdom of God fair? And if it is, what's fair? Here, here's, if I can just drop a bomb on you. Because I wrestled, some sermons come easy. I'll just be honest with you. Some come easy. It's like they're easy to write. You know, John three sixteen. you know, easy. You know, God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. I can preach that. This one, I sat for hours going, I don't get it, God. And then once I did get it, I went, I don't like it, God. And then I have to look at my own life and go, how does this fit, God? And then how does it fit our culture and our context? And our, This one was a struggle. And here's what I landed, okay? Grace is based on who God is, not who we are. What, what does grace have to do with it? If you say this, how did we get to grace? Grace makes fairness unnecessary. Let me say that again. Write it down. This took forever to get this, so please just give me something for it, Okay. <laughs> Grace makes fairness unnecessary. What broke the whole story and what broke the whole parable, and I think what broke the mind thinkingness, mindset, whatever you want to call it, what broke it is when Jesus introduced grace into the story. I think when we read this, when we read stories like this or parables like this, whatever, we often ascribe ourselves to the person that needs vindication. Most of us, as you heard me tell this story, you probably went, I'm the one that's been in the field all day. I'm the one that was there at 6 a.m. I'm the one that worked. I'm the one that sweat. I'm the one that paid. I'm the one that put in my time. I'm the one that is due, and I can see this other person, and they're getting what I believe I am due, and it is unfair, and it is unjust, and it, sometimes if we're not careful, we, it almost, we turn it into our prayer lives and go, God, can you write that wrong, please? Either increase me or decrease them, but either way, I'll be happy if we're being honest. But if you start getting at the, the idea of fairness, as soon as Jesus introduced grace, and it was grace for a specific group of people, in this case, it was those hired at nine. But, but even more so, those hired at 12. Even more so at three, and then the most so at five. They did nothing. Let's be honest. And they walked away with a day's wage. They received 
grace and grace abundantly. They received a lot of it. If you want to know what grace means, right, if I, if I can define it in a way that's different than maybe what you've heard, uh, I, I wrote it down somewhere. I don't remember. This has been a long week. <laughs> grace, uh, I, I believe what it said is it was undeserved or unmerited favor. Think about that for a second. What is grace? Favor that you didn't earn. What is grace? A beneficial outcome that you are not entitled to. What is grace? Benefit of the doubt when you lack a, 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 a background that deserves that or earns that. It's like you've repeated it over and over and over. Grace, you haven't earned this. You haven't deserved this. You, you haven't achieved this, or you're not due this, but I gave it to you anyway. When Jesus introduced grace into this entire parable, it turned it upside down, and it bothered, and I think it's why it bothered me so much. I think it bothered Peter. I think it bothered the other the other guys in the story as Jesus depicted. I think it bothered the disciples. I think it bothers many of us because we say, but kind of deep down secretly, I want fairness. But do you? When we zoom out of this story, and if we look at the overall narrative of Scripture, we look at Genesis to Revelation and the story of God coming after humanity, do you know what fairness is in our relationship with Him? Hell. That's what it is. The way God set up the world, the way he, he wrote the Ten Commandments and he wrote his word, what he said is if we live without him, if we sin against him, we create a barrier and a chasm between us and him, and, and there's no room for making up for it. We can't. We can't make up for it. The, the sacrifice that was required for sin and brokenness and wronging God was death. Something needed to die, and it needed to be perfect. There aren't enough things in the world that could be killed to make that right. And that's why Jesus came, and he entered the scene. He lived a perfect life. He was the Son of God. He went to the cross, and he died to introduce the idea and this topic of, say it with me, grace. Jesus on the cross earned what we could never earn for ourselves. He lived a perfect life, and he said, I would like to trade places with them. Why? Because I love them. I'm just so moved by them. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. What, what they earned and what they deserve, and if we're honest, what is fair is separation from God because God's holy and he's perfect and he's righteous and he's pure and you can't mix that with me, which is dirty, sinful, broken. Those two can't mesh. So for eternity, the way it's set up, if nothing else is introduced, is separation from God. But you enter Jesus into the equation, and grace becomes available for all through Jesus. Is that fair? No. And I say this, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank God that he's not fair. I'm so grateful to him. I know what I'm due. I know what I'm owed. If I look at my own life, if I look at the blessings and the gifts, if I look at the way that he's provided and taken care of me, if I look at just material things, I go, man, I'm so blessed. I'm so taken care of. I've received so much grace. But then if I get deeper and if I go a layer deeper, I look at relationships and I look at my relationship with God and I look at what God should have done with me versus what he's allowed me to be a part of. And I go, man, I've received a lot of grace. Here's the, the distinctive of the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus is trying to describe what the kingdom of God is actually like. The kingdom of God is marked by people who operate from grace, not for fairness. Those who operate from grace. In one of the, the verses that I, I went through this process called, called confirmation when I was a kid, and the verse that I chose, and it's really stuck with me for most of my life, it's Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, and it reads like this, for it is by, say it with me, grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God has made his grace available to you, to me, to our world, to our families and neighborhoods, to classrooms and businesses and organizations. God has made his grace available. But the kingdom of God, if you're going to call yourself a part of the kingdom of God, the distinctive there is you become a conduit of grace. You want to short circuit the brokenness in your marriage, introduce grace. Stop keeping score, introduce grace grace. If you want to short circuit the brokenness in your workplace, introduce grace. doesn't matter what it is, the more grace that you can add, the more grace you can represent, the more grace you can steward will change your workplace. You want to change your neighborhood? You want to change your friend group? You want to change your small group? You want to change whatever context that you are in where brokenness and pain and division, are, it's just a petri dish of all of those, and it's just, it looks so broken and so messy and unfair. If you want to change that situation, I'm not messing with you, just introduce grace into the equation. When you are put in the place to do something, to change something, to say something, wield grace and make it a habit. And watch what happens in your context as a result. This parable, as the band comes back out here, this parable got me thinking a lot about work this week. Most of us work. Right? We do something. We contribute something. We add something. Maybe you get a paycheck. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're retired. Maybe you're in the workplace. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. Whatever your, your, I don't even know, description would be, Whatever that is, where can you introduce grace into your workplace? I I was around a lot of different people in a lot of different environments this last week, and I wanted to write them down because it was it was a ton. Uh, I was around uh, an engineer, a business consultant, a financial advisor, a construction worker. I'm trying to remember an architect, a government worker. I mean, I, I was around a ton. That was like, I think, a third of my list. I was around so many of these different types of people. Think about how you could change your environment or your workplace or your context if you simply be one that, that wields grace on behalf of the kingdom of God. As I close, there, there's a person that comes to my mind that I actually went and toured uh, where they work this last week. There's been something in the, in the mix for six weeks, eight weeks, something like that. A friend of mine uh, here at our church, he's been here a lot longer than I have, uh, but he gave his life to Christ uh, kind of later in life. And, and if I could pick somebody that really embodies grace, represents grace, I mean, just the picture of who they are is just, it's like grace. It's, it's this guy, and he asked me not to share his name, so I'm not going to share his name. Uh, but I went to his workplace, and he, he's a brilliant engineer. Oversees a lot of different people, a lot of different processes for a pretty large company. And so I showed up, and I visited him, and, and we, we jumped on this golf cart, which was so fun. I, I don't get to drive a golf cart at work usually. So, and I wasn't allowed to drive this one for other reasons. So I just sat in the passenger seat, and he, he took me around this 450,000 square foot building, and he starts showing me the process and showing me how, how what he does makes an impact and makes a difference. And, and, and here's the thing that stuck out to me is person after person after person after person after person that we talk to loves him. Loves him. And I know why. It's because he's a person that just embodies grace. He embodies the person of Jesus. Even when you're do something or when you don't do or perform the way that you should or when you come up short or when you blew up something in your life or you showed up late, all of these people, it was just funny as they interacted with him, it's kind of they just gravitated towards him. It's just like a magnet. They just want to be around him. They want to be with him. They want to be around him. And, And then he comes here all week long at camp and he pours his heart out for all of these kids to show them grace you could do that. He doesn't have any phrase he uses. He doesn't have any Bible verse tattooed on his forehead. He doesn't, he's just himself. He uses the gifts that God's given him in the context that he's called him to. And he just points people to Jesus, even through his actions. But it's through the way that he wields grace. What area of your life needs grace? 
not just for you, but through you. What's broken? What's unfair? What's not right? I put these questions in Who? It's a who. Who needs grace in your context? Who needs it? We all know you need it. Who needs it through you? Who do you need to give it to? Who do you need to steward it for? And then here's the last one. How can I steward it on God's behalf? What, what, what can you do? What can you do for somebody? What can you say for somebody? What, what can you give to somebody as a representation of God to their brokenness, to their injustice, to their pain? Our world is desperate for a savior. And the thing that makes Christianity different than every other religion is grace. Everything else, you gotta work for it. You gotta earn it. At the end of your life, you gotta balance, did I do enough, did I not do enough? In the kingdom of God, Jesus did enough. So you are enough. And the gap there is called grace. Who are you called to steward that for right now? I'd love for us to stand. We're gonna dive in to worship and keep moving. Uh, but I, I want you to pray for the person in your context that needs grace. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that in a second. I, I want you to name that person just in your prayer and ask God to show you a way to steward that grace for their benefit. So God, we just come before you right now, just grateful for Jesus, grateful for grace grateful that we can be a people that actually has access to you, that we can encounter you, that we can hear from you, we can experience you, that we can receive the life-changing benefit of grace right here and right now today through your son, Jesus. And God, right now, I just, I ask, Lord, uh, that you would hear everybody say one name right now, somebody that needs grace from them, that they would just say it to you right now, that they need grace. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child, maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker or a boss. Maybe it's a classmate or a friend or a teacher. Maybe it's a mentor. God, I just pray right now that, that we would say their name to you and that you would show us right now as we leave today, that you would show us how to wield grace on your behalf, that you've called us to them, to their context, to their brokenness, not to bring fairness, but to bring the same thing that we have received from you, and that is grace. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, and it is out of this place of gratitude for the grace that we have received that we worship right now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said.
of Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day saved. So let's give him the worship that he is due this morning as we sing about his amazing love. So sing this. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so
Mountain, you won't climb up, coming after me. Come on, sing it if you know it. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Let's try that again. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain, you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't Amen. Amen. Well, hey, listen, thanks for joining us today. Uh, whether you're in person or watching online, uh, I know this probably hits something significant in all of you, especially when there's an area of brokenness or pain or division or something that's not right. I mean, you, you talk about adding grace into a broken situation. I, I know what the brokenness is like. So I, I just want to remind you of this. We have a prayer team. Blake talked about it earlier. They're right in the back. They're underneath that banner. If you just want somebody to pray with you, uh, even today, to walk with you through that, uh, stop it at the prayer banner. Uh, if you don't want to do that or if you're watching online, if you don't have time today, frontlinejr.com slash prayer. Uh, it makes a world of a difference, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us through that as his representative and ambassador. So as we close, close here at Frontline, uh, one thing we love to do is close with a benediction. And so if you're new, brand new, if you don't know what benediction means, it just means blessing. We just want to bless you on your way out. So if you want to extend your hands just like this, just in a posture of reception uh, to receive this blessing as we leave today. So brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, you're the representatives of God. And as recipients of his grace, as you leave today, go back into your context into your neighborhoods, into your workplaces, into your marriages, your families, and be stewards of the grace that you've not just received, but the grace that you've also been entrusted with. Do it in Jesus' name, and all God's people said together, amen. We love you guys. We'll see you next week as we continue on the series, Kingdom Culture.